we're here today with uh, Alex from uh, Straight from Mitzvot from Zenoel. And we've been working together a little bit on showcasing how you might set up like our, your rag uh, pipeline um, to, and doing that actually with seeding it with synthetic data from uh, this label and also being able to fine tune and evaluate that synthetic data with Argilla or doing some pipe checks or these kind of things. And this is actually part of bigger initiative that, that Miles hosting and that they are, that Alex will probably introduce a bit more. So this meeting is recorded. You'll get to ask questions either during the meeting and then we'll try to answer them via chat, but also after the meeting, we'll be able to go through each one of your questions and try to answer them one by one and maybe also have some space for discussion and these kind of things. So I want to ask Alex to take it over and introduce himself and ZML and also the LLM guides uh, that you've been working on. Thank you very much. I congratulate you for your pronunciation of my name. I think it's the first person someone gets it right perfectly. Perfect. <laughs> okay, I will just see if I can share my screen. Okay. I guess you can see just my screen, right? Yeah, perfect. Hang on, that's good. Listen, uh, also, this, uh, uh, sorry? Uh, also the sidebar, but I'm not sure if it's intended. Yeah, it's okay. fine. Um, okay. we'll, we'll switch in between things. Yeah. Great to have everyone here. Um, I'm going to uh, dive into it a little bit. As David said, this is part of a wider, uh, a wider project we've been, wor we've been working on at ZML to introduce people to the world of, I would just point you to maybe my colleagues might post things in the, in the chat, but to, to a couple of things, we have this ZML projects repository and this LLM complete guide is uh, a little bit where we showcase this particular part of the project. What we're doing here is a building a rag pipeline for chat applications showing this. And we held a previous webinar where we talked through the kind of the initial bits of building, building a rag pipeline. Whereas today we're going to be obviously talking about fine tuning embeddings for, for retrieval. And I would just, there is a kind of a documentation. Yes. Uh, we have in our documentation, this LLM ops guide, which is the, if you prefer reading things and don't want to watch a webinar, watch uh, or, or look at code necessarily, we have this guide where we talk through rag evaluation re-ranking, and now we have this extra kind of fine tuning embeddings section. So I encourage you to take a look at that. So a few seconds on me, it's nice to know who you're speaking to or hearing from. I'm an ML engineer at, at ZenML. I've been there for about three years doing various things on the team. I also blog at mlops.systems, a lot of stuff on LLM, listen to LLM fine tuning at the moment, and also I'm blogging on, on the ZenML blog talking about the things that we're doing and the feature for, that are coming out with ZML. I'm based in the Netherlands. I have two cats. Normally when we're doing computer vision webinars and things like that, I get to pull out cute photos of my cats, but my cats don't lend themselves really to large language models. So I'm just putting up gratuitous photos here of Aria and Lupus. So just a quick overview of the agenda. I'll talk a little bit about what ZML is. Um, I'll get into the specific example of embeddings, fine tuning for those who I haven't necessarily made the connection between embedding spine tuning and, and RAG. Then we'll jump into the majority of what we're going to talk about, which is basically synthetic data generation with the label. Then we'll switch to a little bit where David will talk about Argilla and uh, iterating and improving on the data set, some work that he, he did there. Then we'll dive back into the ZML side, fine tuning the model, evaluating it, showcasing things on the ZML model control plane and within the ZML dashboard. Uh, and in general, overall, like I hope there are some people I know in who are here who come a little bit more from the ZML side. So it'll be great to introduce them to these two really great tools, Vista Label and Arjuna, and how to use them within a pipeline in ZML. And then from the other side, yeah, just introducing ZML as an MLOps framework that can bring that can bring everything together. And yeah, throughout this presentation, we're just gonna, as I said, head to this to this endpoint where we have fine-tuned embeddings based on synthetic data generated with just the label and then annotated and reviewed through Argilla. And it would say at any point, if there are questions, just interrupt me. I can't really see the windows. So you'll have to make a sound, but that's okay. And I wanted to start off just quickly talking about NML. I promise this won't be, be too long, but I think it will help situate the conversation we're talking about. In general, when you're working as a team and working among different people, particularly on complex projects, which involve lots of different pieces. It can be difficult if you decide to manually stitch all of these things together. To start with, there's a lot of tools, there's a lot of pieces to doing machine learning and production, and there's also a lot of infrastructure and things you have to keep hold of to manage. 
And so what ZenML is a layer, which a platform, which brings all of these things together. So you can focus on the things that you care about, the pieces of, the, of machine learning, where you're actually delivering value instead of necessarily worrying about gluing all of these tools together or managing your infrastructure or getting started and, and, and putting these things together. So how it works in general, there's some syntax that you need to do to construct steps and put those steps together into pipelines. I'll show you how this looks in code in a second, but basically you're writing Python. Your code doesn't really change much. It's still the same machine learning code that you would be writing normally. And you still use the, all the same tools that you're used to using. Your code runs on stacks and stacks are a collection of different components and pieces of infrastructure, and you can have different stacks. You can have a local stack, which runs things on your local computer. And then for bigger tasks, you could run things in, in your, yeah, on GCP or on AWS or something. Then, sorry, I'm just, then you've got, yes, yeah, so you have stacks. And then the framework is, is basically handling, handling everything else. So this includes caching for, for the steps that you're running, which is super useful when you're iterating. It handles connecting to all of your infrastructure, which is often a pain. It handles versioning your code tracking your data, all of these kinds of things, which you can take for granted when you're using a tool like ZenML, but if you're doing it manually, uh, it's a bit of a pain. Okay. So that's ZenML, very high level overview. And let's get into the, what we're all here for, talk about RAG and embeddings. So we've got a basic kind of RAG pipeline, which I'll talk you through in case there's anyone who's unfamiliar with the, the basics. And this is a link to the LLM ops guides that I showed earlier. So there's kind of two pieces to it. There's a pre-processing or a pre-inference piece, which you do. In our specific case for this project, we are basically building a kind of Q&A chat box, classic RAG use case for, with LLMs. And so the data sources here were in the ZenML documentation. So we scraped this from, uh, from ZenML, as I'll show you in a second, split this into chunks and into smaller pieces, because basically we want to take only small bits of the documentation and pass them into the large language models. We generate embeddings. This is the nub of what we're going to be talking about today. So the embeddings are a vector-based representation, which allow you to search for and search through your text data and get similar text data um, to whatever the thing is that you're interested in. And once you've generated these for all of your chunks, uh, you store them in a vector store. There are fancy new vector stores available now, but you can also just do things in Postgres. There's some great plugins uh, that allow you to, to store vectors on Postgres in a kind of no quantified tool. And then at the point where you have set up your Slack bot or whatever the precise uh, UI is, you maybe have some user query and the user maybe asks something like, I don't know, how do I use a particular tool with ZML? And then what will, what your inference pipeline will do is search the embedding space for any of the chunks, which are similar to that particular query. And then it'll get some number of chunks similar to that query, pass them to an LLM to resynthesize, and then you'll get some kind of response out at the end. This is the overall motivation for, for how this works. But I just want to remind everyone of this upfront, probably is old hat to many of you, but we're going to be talking about the, this embeddings bit because out of the box, like people will use the standard embeddings available on the Hugging Face Hub, for example, sentence transformers models, which people use. But if your data set is contains things which are slightly out of the ordinary or yeah, there's lots of different reasons why you maybe want to get better performance. And for that you can use, yeah, you can fine tune your own embeddings. Uh, I'll just pause here for a second. Are there any questions, maybe questions coming in through the chat or wherever it is? Yep. I phrased one question. Uh, did, did you also play around with the semantic chunking for the process? We played around with lots of different ways of chunking things down in terms of like sections and so on. There was no clear winner so far. The things that would seem to work best were dropping piece, dropping things. So in our documentation, there's chunks of logs and chunks of code. You can't drop everything, obviously, because then you lose a lot of the content, which is useful, but I, I wouldn't say there was an obvious, an obvious winner there. Okay. Thanks. So let's jump to the starting point of our data set. This is a big public data set on the Hugging Face data sets hub. Um, we can just take a look at the kind of data. This is the kind of thing that we're dealing about. So this is a, a chunk here in this page content column. It's a little bit of our documentation. And it's, if you look at it, it's documentation around associating a pipeline with a model. And it has a source URL and a token count as well as some metadata about exactly where this came from in our documentation. So. 
what we really want is to reverse, reverse our way back from some kind of question to this documentation. So the query that someone might be asking is simply, how do I associate a pipeline with a model? That's an obvious one, but there might be other kind of slightly different wording or, or slightly different use case, which comes up where it would be appropriate to direct someone or to use this, passing it into the LLM. So what we're going to be wanting to do today is generate data, which is going to generate a question, which would then be associated in vector space uh, with this. And old school pre LLM, maybe what you might do, especially if it was a really valuable problem for you to solve, you may even manually create these, create these questions. So you might uh, literally create a new column and type to yourself question here is like, how do I associate a pipeline with a model? And what you might also do is create a negative example. So a question which has nothing to do with this. So that when you're training, you can say, associate it more closely with the positive example questions than with the, the negative ones. But with LLMs, obviously we have a helpful tool that can yeah, help us in this process. So there are some pipelines that I want to talk about and guide us through today. There's the synthetic data generation, this label pipeline. And I'm going to talk about it in at a high level overview and then hand it over to, to David. But what we're doing is we're loading this hugging, hugging face data set, the one that I just showed you, in fact, it gets split into a train and test set for obvious reasons. Then we have a step, so this is a ZML step, which generates synthetic queries. This is where the just label magic happens. And then this outputs two uh, separate data sets, which are basically updated versions of the original data set that contain the positive and negative queries. And then both of these are both pushed to hugging face and pushed to Argilla. And I can just very quickly show you what this looks like. So also a separate data set. So if we go back to the same example that we were looking at before about associating a pipeline with a model, we have new columns here. We have this positive one, and this is generated with GPT 4.0 and it's chosen question, a good question to associate with this documentation is how can I associate a pipeline with a specific model in ZML? And the negative one would be, what are the main benefits of using ZML for data versioning? And you see how here, actually this negative one is, it's still ZML related. It's not completely random. It's not what is the price of, I don't know, potatoes in the market, but it's something that we still, it's close enough to ZML, but we don't want it to be associated with this particular thing. Then there's some dis this label metadata and of course the model, model name. And if I just go back to, to the pipeline again, why are we pushing it to having face to start with? There are a number of tools which just work better with when you can provide like a hugging face data set ID. It is still version. You see these data outputs, output pieces. It is version that tracks within ZML, but we just go to the extra step of pushing it to hugging face because it works better with Mozilla and other tools in the end that's duplicated there. So I would now hand over to David to talk through some of the code a bit further. Perfect. I will share my screen. Under the boot, what actually happens is that we've configured these out of the box, the, these pipelines to actually work with ZML. And we also base these pipelines of this abstractified Jupyter notebook, so to say. So I'm going to dive a bit into like this label, into Argilla, into the process of understanding your data, understanding the pipeline before you actually abstractify that and bring it in to ZML to productionize it. So the first thing that we normally start off with is like a data set pipe check. Everyone always says, look at your data, but in practice, nobody really, not everyone takes the required time to, to do so. so we already have this uh, yeah, brief overview that Alex went over before, just to pipe check. And there's this cool new feature within Hugging Face, within the Hugging Face hub. And that means that you actually can embed iframes with, of the data set viewer within hugging phase, within yeah, any arbitrary place that you need them. I believe that ZML also jumped directly on top of this and you can actually uh, see them uh, within the ZML UI and interface as well. And I guess uh, Alex will, will show that in a bit. So yeah, you can actually explore, you can filter, you can see some of these labels here as well, some uh, token lengths. So for example, you can see that the yeah, page content is distributed around this, probably the chunking uh, size that uh, we actually set up for the chunking me mechanism. And then whenever you scroll down, then what we can also do is instead of doing this individual kind of vibe checking, also just load the data to disk instead of using the side frame and embedded data set viewer. Then for static data generation, we actually have this second tool called DC label, which can work nicely together with Argena, but can also be used individually. 
And for DC label, what it does is abstractify a lot of these prompt templates and paper definitions and all of these well-known and well-loved research papers and allows to pour this into a scalable and, and user-friendly pipeline. And that's the general idea behind it. This label has like different nodes and different pipelining structures, where in this case, we'll actually be using the load data from hub node or step, and also the generate sentence bear step for open AI uh, and for the specific uh, sentence generation, we'll be using the open AI LLM and we will here, we are like just initializing it with a specific model and specific API key. And then for the load data from hub, which we forward is actually passing some examples and the number of examples that we require and also an output mapping to actually ensure that the original data set column is actually forwarded to the correct expected column with it, it generate set the spare thing. On top of that, what you can do is actually enable or dislabel, enable or disable the generation of positives and negatives as well. And the thing that we also added recently was the flag to include hard negatives. So these are negatives that kind of phrased in the same way as the original sentence, but that are yeah very di uh, difficult to dis distinguish from the uh, original uh, query. Then whenever you would actually run the pipeline, it looks like this. So you run the pipeline, you potentially add some pipeline run parameters, for example, for the LLM generation, so that you can iterate and alternate between some uh, configuration options. In this case, we'll just use some defaults for the temperature and the maximum num number of generated tokens. And then what we uh, come up with is actually this uh, yeah, data set dictionary uh, that we, we can then later on use with all of these uh, generated examples. So we can actually run this because we only use 15 examples. It takes 45 seconds, but also we yeah, are depending on the number of LMG you use, if you run it locally or remote, uh, it will actually speed up or, or be a bit slower. And then after running, this is all like logging to validate the pipeline to see if it's a proper direct acyclic cuff and these kind of things before you actually spend all of your credits and then find out that, yeah, your, your synthetic data generation pipeline isn't working as it's supposed to. Then after all of the validation and the generation, what we can see is that uh, on top of the original data set, we actually have these uh, positive, negative examples and also like this uh, metadata and these kind of things that, that uh, Alex already uh, mentioned before. And here you can also see like the, the anchor and see, yeah, that. Apparently this is a yeah, decent example, I would say of a positive and a negative query. Um, after that, we can actually optionally push to hub, but then what also is uh, op denoted as optional, but actually isn't, uh, in our opinion is, uh, yeah, doing another like vibe check, just checking your data, looking at your data and playing around with it. And it's not very interesting to look by data one by one. So what we can actually do is add like some tools and features and do some feature engineering to actually be able to uh, look at your data more effectively, more intuitively, and uh, in, a, in a more engaging way, so to say. And uh, what I came up with during this process was actually to create these similarity embedding vectors for the anchor, the, the anchor, the positive, and the negative pair within the data set, and then do the, the cosine, take the cosine similarity of each one of these. And then normally when you look at the cosine similarity or look at uh, the, the outliers, so to say, for these kind of things, you already find some interesting examples. And that's the same with, for example, making a text classification probability, text classification, and then looking at the outliers for the probability of these text classifications. If the probability is very high or very low, they can already find these uh, weird examples within the bunch. And in order to determine what kind of sentence transformer model you need to use for these kind of things, and also for your REC pipeline, is that you can use this uh, cool benchmark. It's also, once again, a iframe embedded within the Jupyter Notebook, but it's the, the benchmark that evaluates uh, sentence embedding models. And within this benchmark, you can actually like filter down and select the kind of model that you want, and then just filter on the highest performance. So in this case, yeah, we can apply some basic filters. So let's go for a small model, but not too small. And then what we can do is, for example, focus on the task of retrieval because we're working with a rack pipeline. You can also do re-ranking and then you end up with apparently these uh, cool snowflake open source models that you can use for free and, and uh, use out of the box as well. 
You can still check what the underlying data sets are that they use. For example, if they used it specifically for a medical domain or these kind of things, it will not show up because it's like the average score that we're looking at, but you might be able to look at some other scores within the, the official dashboard as well. So that's also the model that we'll be using, the Snowflake M model. Uh, we haven't included uh, the 1.5 version, but might be able to do that in a, in a follow-up. I will just loading it uh, within the sentence transformer version of the model and then uh, enable MPS because I'm using a Mac to actually uh, speed up the computation. Uh, on top of that, you can also basically look at your data a bit more within this embedded R frame. And you can also look at the, the sentence lengths and these kind of things. So interestingly, the positive generations are a bit longer than the negative generations. So these are already some things that you can pick up just by looking at the distribution within your data set, looking at something that actually provides, uh, is provided by Hugging Face Hub out of the box for free as well. So that's really easy to get, do some initial five checks. You might be able to filter on, on length and these kind of things. And then normally, for example, longer queries might be too complex and not really representing the global user query. There's some other things that you might be able to pick up there. Uh, alternatively, we can also load to data. And what we, what I will do next is just go over this uh, data formatting function as a batch function on top of the, the, the data set with, that we had. And what I will do is compute the embeddings for each one of these uh, original vectors, like the anchor positive and negative, and then get the similarities. So the different, the cosine similarities for each one of these vectors. And these will result in these out scores that I can use to find and, and move uh, out the, and clean the outliers. So after that, we can actually create some plots, for example. So this is just a plot, plotting function that I got from ChatGPT, but kind of gives the, the general idea that there's like a score between the similarity of the positive query and the similarity of the negative query with the anchor, where you would assume that the positive query has a higher similarity, which is better because then it would have been found by the model and comparatively the negative query uh, should have a relatively lower similarity because then it wouldn't have been found or isn't competing with the positive anchors that much. Then what I will do is based on the assumption that you actually want to either maximize or minimize this retrieval chance, so to say, you can actually, by just looking at your data and making some basic assumptions already filter out some of these uh, yeah, outliers. And whenever you do that, you end up with this more nicely separated overview of your data where there's just more blue, so more similarity with positive anchors and less uh, similarity with the negative anchors. And this is already a very intuitive way to filter out some data, but there's one kind of problem with this is that you know, we didn't look at the scores. We didn't really look at the data. So it might also be a messy way because you can still uh, filter out a lot of data that's within maybe a one specific section that isn't covered well by our original embedding model. So it might be better to add something more visual. And another thing that I added, just some code that goes over the dimensionality, the reduction of the embeddings, and then also plotting them on just scatter plot. And when you have this, you can actually go over all of these pairs. You can look at all of the similarities of different anchors. You can filter based on like positive anchor or these kind of things. And based on this, you can already filter out like a lot more of these examples and also see that, for example, the positive anchor alignment, so to say, is way higher for legacy docs, for random docs, for stacks, components, and these kind of things. So just playing around with this very basic plotly kind of overview already gives you a, a lot more intuition about your data as well. And then of course, lastly, what you can do is also go a bit more in depth, like one by one and actually upload your data into Argela. So for Argela, we actually, we use the same data set structure. And for this data set structure, we actually need to define a data set settings object. So for the settings, what we'll be doing is defining a field, which is fixed and fixed to the anchor. We'll be defining two questions. So these are like responses that an annotator that yourself can, can alter or can influence and are supposed to correct. And then we'll be adding some of this uh, metadata, like the token counts, the original parent section, 
some of these uh, similarity measures to be able to filter and search more efficiently. And on top of that, we'll also be adding the, this uh, anchor fat vector to do semantic search eventually. We'll just create a data set. Uh, this is also done under the hoods uh, within the SNML code. And then after that, we'll actually just loop through the records and uh, generate, like, loop through the data and generate records for Argilla that can then be pushed to the specific data set. So this is actually for the part of the first pipeline. And before handing it over to Alex again, I would like to go to the Argilla environment, briefly show you what that looks like. So here within Argilla, you then end up with this like Argilla space that I cloned at host tracking place with two data sets. So the initial one and the DC labeled one. And this C-labeled one actually also has all of these uh, features included. So interestingly, what you can do uh, now is, for example, sort, then select the similarity of the anchor and the negative or the positive and the negative, and then sort on like the outliers. So here the anchor and the negative are very similar. So maybe we'll end up like with some examples that are too complex for the model to pick up that are very similar in terms of like the phrasing are very similar in terms of like the, the general I idea. And that would mean that whenever you query, you'll end up like with the positive examples, but according to the model, they, they, the model might also associate that with the negative examples that you don't want. In a similar way, you can maybe add some other sorting mechanism. So very low similarity between maybe the positive and the negative. And then you'll end up with a positive query that might be relevant, but a negative query that's complete nonsense. In this case, uh, what are the main components for, for uh, car engines? And this would actually be data that you're training on if you don't filter out this, this data from, from your data set. So it's good to go over to actually understand what's within your data by adding these kind of features under the hood you actually end up with like more usable, more engaging filtering, similar to the main feature for your latest iPhone, which would be a very unrealistic query done within the ZML documentation for a specific red pipeline. So that's the things that I wanted to show you guys, and I'll give it over to Alex again. Thank you. So I will share basically the win go into all of those details, but actually these things come together within the ZML pipeline, the code is basically the same. We, we just talked about these pieces of the pipeline. We talked about the Argilla push, good. And now if I just go into my ID, um, you should be able to see, yeah, the pipeline on the left and actually that same DAG that you were seeing, but we're using the ZML VS code extension. So we can just view a recent version of the pipeline and, and render that DAG. So these DAGs are, are these pipelines put together by composing steps together. And basically depending on how the data flows, as you can see in this, this visualization, this will determine like when pipelines run. So obviously we're not going to push to Argilla before we've done all of the, all of the earlier steps. I can just run the pipeline now, since one of the nice things about ZML is that it caches, caches things when you don't need to rerun things. So this is going to show up actually. In a second, it's running. It's going to show up in the US code extension. And since we didn't change any code or change any of the settings or anything, basically all of the different pieces of this pipeline are going to are going to be in cached. So it's using the cached version of the step, using the cached version of this one, and so on. And there's actually two layers of, of caching going on. So if I look at the code for the data generation, and we're looking at the wrong pipeline, sorry about that. Uh, uh, if I look at the code for the synthetic data generation, you see it's, it's the same code that was in the notebook, just within a function that has this step decorator on top. The rest of the code is the same. And Argilla itself within its own pipeline, Argilla also uses an abstraction called a pipeline, has its own caching mechanism. So even if ZenML hadn't, hadn't cached the, cached the steps, it will run now, Argilla actually wouldn't go to GPT-4.0 and generate all of these examples all over again, because it knows it has them in the cache. Uh, you can, I think, pass in, um, pass in an argument here to turn the cache off. 
Uh, but that's super useful because you don't want to waste your money re re querying GPT for uh, for these things. And yeah, it allows you to iterate fast. And the stack which I'm running this in, I, I'm just doing this all locally since there's nothing particularly compute heavy that I need to do. But you could easily switch your stack either here in the VS Code expansion or by the CLI and so on to run this in the cloud uh, and have the fine tuning pipeline that's maybe my, what you might want to do. And at this point, like all of your data has been pushed to Argilla and Hugging Face there, as, as David just said, you might want to go through and actually annotate some things. So you might want to update things and so on, click submit, you get this nice little bar here showing your progress. I'm sure as a good data scientist, you would make sure to annotate all the way from 0.12% all the way up to 100%. We're not going to do this now live, but yeah. One can assume that you're going to take a bit of time with your data, annotate it, make sure it's it's doing what you want, and do the kind of exploratory things that the data was just showing. At a certain point, like you actually want to get around to fine tuning your model, and this is where we might shift to a different pipeline within ZML, which is doing doing some slightly different things. It's fairly standard in terms of just fine tuning a pre-trained model. We're loading some data, we get a data set at the end of this, we run the fine tuning itself. At the end of the fine tuning process, we evaluate both the fine tuned model and the base model, and these give us some results. And we have a separate thing where we can visualize them. And but I could run this now as well. Yeah. Most of this will be cached as well, so it will run through fairly quickly. And you get a, a fine tuned model as well coming output from this fine tune step itself. It's stored and versioned in ZML, as we'll see in a second, but it's also pushed to the Hugging Face Hub. I show you, yeah, there's some nice kind of convenience things where if you use sentence transformers, the library to, to train your model and use their kind of push to hub, it creates all this metadata, including the metric, including like specific samples. And if you actually want to, to run it and use it with inference, I think it generates specific example, or uh, yeah, here in the example, if you want to just run this code snippet, it's actually using specific examples from your data set, which is super nice. And all, all the usual things that you know from the Hugging Face, like models. models. If I look into the actual implementation of the fine channel pipeline, there's one thing I want to draw your attention to in the load data step. Sorry if I'll just look at it. Have the right guide here. So we've got this at the beginning, we've got this prepare load data step. And there's actually a condition here, like we can either say we want to use the Argilla annotations. So if we have a bunch of annotations, we want to use those for fine tuning, the updated, the corrected ones, then we can just use this. And it connects to the ZML annotator integration it's built in with, with Argilla and it's using kind of 2.0. Or if you just want to uh, experiment with the actual, just the kind of the raw data that was generated with this label, you just don't pass that flag. And you see here, like the embedding was pipeline ran as well. I'm going to show you all of this, what this looks like in the Ruminal Dev Board in a second. Everything else, the code is available. I'm not going to walk through it. It's pretty, pretty standard, pretty standard stuff. We're actually using like a Matryoshka MOS function where we take different slices at different resolutions. So normally what people might do is you might have very specific loss function, very fine grained, focused on very specific features. Or you have very high level features, which are much more general. So it's able to determine whether something is about machine learning or cats or, or whatever. And the nice thing with the Matryoshka loss function is it blends these different dimensions. Yeah. That's the kind of the high level explanation of, of what's going on there. And there's a whole bunch of parameters that you can pass in and we, we train the model, we push it to the hub, and then we log a bunch of metadata into the, uh, into the ZML, into the ZML dashboard. And that's what I want to take a look at now to show you how this all comes together. So this is the one of our tenants on ZML, where you can see we can dive into the a recent version of the fine chain, which was ran. It shouldn't take so long. Look me out. So I'm going to show the output of the fine tuning. So this is the one we just, just ran. You can see all of these, the kind of grayed out icons mean that this relates to cached, cached runs. And so here, looking at the pipelines, you can see details of the stack that you run it on. Essentially, there was no metadata here. For the individual steps, you can see lots of different pieces of information. You can see the codes for that particular step. If there were any interesting, particularly interesting logs here, for example, on the fine tuning step, I can take a look at the logs. 
and these are stored and, and version, et cetera, so at a certain point, if you wanted to go back and there's something in the logs that you wanted to inspect for previous pipeline runs, they'd all be here. The cached one, so actually there's nothing interesting to see. And for the particular, for the data itself, if I look at the, the previous synthetic generation pipeline, we can take a look at actually that visualization that David was talking about. Um, this new feature we recently added where you can inspect the data again from within from within the, the Zenimal dashboard. So here is an embedded version of, of that. What I wanted to show though is the uh, kind of a feature of Zenimal which brings everything together. So this is the model control plane. And here you can see actually the different model versions that you have. I will click into the most recent one. So you can see like pipeline runs, which are specific to, to your particular, to the particular model. So here, for example, you've got this heading data generation pipeline here together with the things pipeline. We can, we can have an overview, which explains the different kind of things relating to this particular use case that you're working on. Obviously tagging is there. It collects together the various model artifacts, which are output. So here are the fine tune model specifically that we, that we generated during the fine tuning itself. You can have metadata here associated with that, that model. It's a place where all of the artifacts associated with these pipelines live, different charts, the results, the data sets, and so on. And these are all versions. You can see these different version numbers, and you can see the runs, which that particular version was associated with. It's a great way to keep track of all of the things that you're doing in what can often become like quite, quite, com quite complex, especially when you have lots of different teams that are involved. Potentially, if you deployed your model, we're not doing it here, but the deployment and you can keep track of that particular deployment of a model that would live here. And then you have metadata relating to your particular pipelines. You have eval results, which are displayed here. The dimensions of these Matryoshka loss function are stored here. Some stuff about my local computer that I was running this on. And it's probably worth, as we just ran this. Probably worth taking a look at the results actually, because the whole point of this was that we wanted to improve the performance of the embeddings model on our data, grabbing a chart. So here in blue, we have the, the base model, which wasn't performing that great to start with on our data. And you can see the fine tuned model across these four dimension slices from very coarse to very fine. We've improved it. This is generally my, my experience with fine tuning embeddings models, you can get like a five to 15% improvement, especially when you're starting out from a pretty poor place. What we didn't use some of the filtering that David showcased, if you build that in and you only fine tuned on kind of filtered data and we pulled out some of the logs and so on, we'd be starting from a, low, a higher baseline and so we get better results overall. But in general, the work at this point is like iterating over the data and, and moving through, moving through that way and improving all of the scores here. Yeah. Just to, just to finish, we have these two, two different pipelines here. We have the synthetic data generation, super easy with just a label. We have the Argilla kind of annotation step in the middle. We didn't do this specifically, but that's the kind of the glue that binds, binds these two pipelines together. And then we fine tune the model based on fully synthetic data generated through just a label, visualize the results. Just what you would expect to have this kind of loop between the two where you're annotating and improving your data set having all of it versioned, versioned and tracked through Xenomal. I would stop presenting at this point and um, see if there are any questions or I don't know, David, if you had any observations as you were, as you were watching. So as well, your yes, I think in terms of questions, some of them were already answers. I had one myself about the storage of the artifacts. Are they being stored like uh, twice as in one time in Xenomal and one time in, for example, the Hugging Face Hub? Or is everything stored only in a hub and ZML keeps a reference to that storage? No, they're actually being stored, stored twice. So I was using a, like an Azure artifact store and so they were being stored in Azure and in blob storage somewhere. Obviously all of this is configurable depending on your specific needs, but generally speaking, all of the kind of data tracking and so on happens automatically with ZML. So that's what I would generally rely on, but. As I said, there are some, some of the tools, particularly just to label, like work really nicely together with having face of data sets. Yeah. It doesn't hurt to have them twice. Okay. That's interesting to, to hear. 
And for example, how would you see this pipeline be adapted to also include re-ranking and, and these kind of things? If you go back to the visualization or can you give some ideas on that? So in like, how would we use this with re-ranking or like possibly fine tuning our re-ranking model or so? Yeah. Yeah. Would it be easy to adapt this configuration to, to do that? Uh, yeah, obviously it takes some more code and you need to know exactly what you're doing in the kind of previous version, generally speaking, like on our kind of custom evals, like re-ranking helped again, like it was a five to 7% improvement on, on retrieval performance. We might be able to get another kind of boost if we like custom fine tuned for re-ranking. It would depend on your use case. It depends how often you're updating your data. So this is on ZenML documentation. We put out a new release every two weeks. So maybe you don't want to be refine tuning like both your embeddings yeah. model and your re-ranking model every two weeks. Yeah. Depends, depends a little bit on the use, use code. How important that like final five to 7% is the performance because for, for some use cases, maybe it doesn't matter for yeah. others. It's, it's super important. A bit. Thanks. I'm not sure if anyone in the audience has still has some questions or maybe wants to discuss some of the issues that they've been uh, struggling with themselves. Uh, yeah, I had a quick question. Hope this is not too out of scope. When you generate synthetic data, presumably there's one specific prompt that does that. Do mm -hmm. you find that you need a range of prompts to get a range in the type of synthetic data that you generate, or are you usually okay just using one? And that gives you enough variety in your synthetic data for your downstream tasks. Yeah. In my experience, it really differs per task. So when, whenever we, or at least in a, this label kind of lingo, talk about uh, synthetic data generation, we talk about uh, tasks and these tasks correspond to research papers. So in some cases you will have this task and in this case, for example, the sentence pair generator that really relies on, on input contents and then under the hood, the prompt is phrased in such a way that you really get like the, that it really values also the, the, the context, so to say, but there's also other tasks that don't have this specific prompt structure. So it's always worth looking under the hood, what the, the task actually entails and what the prompt template is for that specific task. Some, a good example is also the ultra feedback task. That is used, that can be used for judging the output of, uh, of the responses of LLMs, so to say. And within this task or within this paper definition, they actually had these different categories by which you would be able to judge the response. And there's also an overall rating. So that really is another example of how that's more task specific than, and therefore also prompt specific. In my experience, it's relatively easy to adapt a prompt whenever you have like the baseline prompt somewhere, uh, and then the baseline implementation and tweak it a little bit, maybe not include uh, like a criteria or like a nuance to the prompt, or maybe add a slight, an extra sentence or these kind of things. And that's also something that we added for like this sentence uh, generate pair generation, tweaked it a little bit, introduced ML as like this MLOps framework, and then yeah, you generally get bad outputs as well. Okay. Yeah, that's super helpful. So far, I've just been including a couple examples in the prompt and that helps with steering as well. Yeah, no, it's just really helpful to think about how you guys are thinking about it. Next. Yeah. Yeah. There's also this concept of retrieval based prompting. So then you would do your rag while you're prompting, so to say. So whenever you push your input, then you first retrieve all of the most relevant examples for that specific input then use those as a seed for your prompt and that should also help with alignment for what you expect as you are an annotator. You would still need these verified somewhere index in the database, but it uh, might help as well. Yeah. Thanks. The other thing I might add, the other thing I might add to this question is, is uh, you can also play around with using a variety of different LLMs um, uh, in the generation, because you can get like sameness in the response or, or sameness in the kinds of ways that the, the responses uh, happen and uh, going from the not so great LLMs to like more capable ones, having a mix. I'm not sure whether this to label allows you to combine multiple LLMs within the same generation pipeline. Yeah, you can. So there's okay. this um, model pooling concept where I, I guess it's based on also the ultra feedback paper where they just had a group of a pool of different models, 50 or so, 
And then for each one of the prompts actually generated four responses with four different models. And then based on that, you had a huge variety within that specific data set, just due to the fact that you yeah, rely on, on different models that generally have a different way of generating data. But the eke out like the very last percent, like it's very much like an experimental science based on like your specific example. Yeah. 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 No, that's super helpful. Lots of references to go chase down. Lots more work to do. Appreciate it. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions from the audience? Maybe not. I guess that whenever someone has uh, final questions, you probably can join the ZML Slack. I, would, I believe you have a Slack, right? Or you can join the Huggy Face Discord. Feel free to send me or Alex an email. And yeah, everyone having joined, thank you for joining and hope to be seeing you like the, during the coming meet, meetups as well. There's going to be this video going to be updated to YouTube and we'll also be adding some of the, the discussed content there. So you'll be, be seeing after. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Bye.